Today, I'm going to take you on a tour deep inside the inner workings of a Vegas slot machine to not only see the secret menus inside the computer where the payouts are set, but also on a tour of how the machines and their software actually works internally. We'll learn how the machines work, and along the way, I'll tell you the full story of my brush with security, as well as some concrete strategy details that can help you to increase your odds of winning by about a solid 6 to 8%. All right here today in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. And today, I'm going to take you behind the scenes to learn precisely how modern slot machine software picks its winners. In preparing this video, I discovered that there is a ton of misinformation out there on slot machine algorithms, and that includes right here on YouTube. Some of the most popular videos on the subject promulgate myths that are not only untrue, but they'd also likely be illegal in most jurisdictions if they were in fact true. I'll do my best to clear those up today as well. I'm a weird combination of being a slot machine player, a software engineer, and a student of combinatorial mathematics. Throw some autism on top of it all, and I learned very early on that the bright color visuals, rotary motion, probability, and let's face it, the allure of maybe making a few bucks, conspired to make the slot machine almost irresistible to me. They tickle me right in the dopamine, I suppose. But a year ago, I was playing the slots in a nearby casino when I hit a moderate jackpot. In a U.S. casino, if you win a jackpot of $1,200 or more, the machine goes into what's known as jackpot lockdown, where you need to wait for an attendant to come over and do three things. First, they verify the jackpot win and your identity. Next, they go and get your money and the dreaded income tax forms for which they needed your identity. And finally, they bring those to you and they unlock the machine so that you can continue playing if you wish. Normally, when the attendant comes over, the information they need is right on the screen and they can use their special unlock key to unlock the machine. It appears that just like opening the glove box on a Tesla, they have to go through several menus and submenus in order to accomplish it. Along the way, I was treated to a visual feast of some of the inner workings of the configuration of the machine. Since I've got a YouTube channel, I decided to film it so that I could share those inner workings with you. And that's where the trouble started. What do you want? I just want to get out of here. I'm sorry, I made a bad mistake. Now, before we look at how the slot machines do what they do, we have to ask a much more fundamental question, which is, what is it that the slot machines are trying to do? Or put more simply, are the slot machines honest? And the answer is fairly simple. Yes, they are, at least where the law requires them to be. In most jurisdictions like Las Vegas, players are protected by things such as the Nevada Gaming Control Act, which spells out fairly specifically how the machines must operate and what schemes they can and cannot employ to entice you into more gambling. For most of what I talk about today, I'm going to base it on the Nevada laws, since that's where many people wind up playing anyway. If you're on a tribal reservation, things will be less certain, but of course, they have local reputations to uphold at a minimum. So that if you're off in some obscure foreign locale or aboard a cruise ship in international waters, then you're pretty much operating solely on the reputation and character of the casino you're playing in, as they can do pretty much whatever they want to do. In Vegas, however, at least the rules are spelled out so you can be an educated player. And being an educated player starts first and foremost with the knowledge that each and every pull on a slot machine is a completely independent mathematical event. It is not influenced in any way by what has happened up to that point. The machines are set to pay out at a particular probability ratio, like 95%. That means if every dollar spent, on average over time, the machine will return 95 cents and the casino will profit the 5 cents. But it doesn't matter if the machine has been paying at 70% or 200% recently. It's still going to determine win-loss based on a 95% return going forward. It's always going forward and it never looks back. How much it has or has not previously paid out is never a factor in the probability calculations. The rules are set for the probability and the machine does not tweak them. In terms of the wild conjecture I've heard in other YouTube videos, perhaps the most prevalent myth is the notion that machines are continually striving to hit their payout ratio over time, which is to say, if they've paid a lot in the past, they need to pay less in the future in order to get back to that desired 95% payout average. This is simply untrue, as the plays would not then be independent events if they incorporated any knowledge of past events into their payouts. Now that means that a machine can, over some shorter period of time, pay 50% if players have been very unlucky, or 20,000% if somebody wins a jackpot, and so on. But over the long haul of months or years, it uses its 95% probability so unrelentingly that it will always trend back towards 95%. But it could take some time, and the important takeaway is that whether the machine has been in a long dry spell or just paid a big jackpot, on the next play, it will simply plot along at the same 95%. Nothing that has gone before will change the odds. 
There's one game mechanism that I think is a tad unscrupulous, where the longer that it's been since a jackpot has been won, the more coins accumulate in some kind of big on-screen bowl or fire pit or something like that. Eventually, the bowl will start to shake and quiver from the weight as though it's all it can do not to burst and spew forth bonus coins on the very next play. And yet, the odds of it doing so remain constant on each play. In most jurisdictions, that would be illegal unless it were a specifically a progressive machine. A progressive machine skims a tiny amount of each play and sets it aside in a separate account for the big jackpot payouts. Your odds still never change, but the size of a payout on a jackpot will be larger the more times that people have played the machine in the interim. Sometimes that winning jackpot is pooled across multiple machines or even across casinos. Those locations all contribute towards the jackpot and any player in any one of the casinos could win that separate jackpot. The odds of hitting the jackpot never change on a progressive from pole to pole, but the potential payout increases. Since the machine in question is not a progressive as far as I know, and neither the size of the payout nor the odds of the payout increase over time, the animations and the depiction of the jackpot seem a little unfair to me. All the display really tells you is how long it's been since someone has won it, and while that preys on most people's emotions and natural instincts, the fact remains that each play is independent, and neither the odds of winning nor the amount of the win have changed no matter how much the bowl is on fire or shaking. That still seems counterintuitive to some folks, but the easiest way to wrap your head around it, I think, is that if a fair coin is tossed and comes up heads five times in a row, the odds of heads on the next toss will feel like it should somehow even things out, but nature doesn't work that way. Each coin flip is still independent, and no matter what streak has gone before it, each flip remains a 50-50 shot at heads or tails on the next try. The fact that this can feel unnatural to us is part of why the machines work and why they're profitable. Even as an engineer who has a fairly good handle on their inner workings, when I have a machine that has been paying consistently, even I hate to go to the bathroom and leave it or whatever. I intellectually know that each pull is independent and that the odds are the same before and after the bathroom break, but it sure feels like anything but. The reason that each pull is independent is because internally, the machine is generating random slot sequences, or more accurately, the random numbers on which they will ultimately be based, thousands if not millions of times per second. It does not simply generate one sequence when you hit spin. Instead, it's always continually generating them by the bajillion, and then the very instant that you hit spin, it snapshots the last one and bases the reels off of that. Even a difference of a few milliseconds in hitting the button in either direction would generate a completely different game unrelated to that one. But how are those random sequences generated, and are there any patterns? Well, if you go back far enough, things were completely different. Back in the late 60s, when I was born, for example, a slot machine's winning and losing combinations were punched into a long loop of paper tape. That paper tape contained the sequences of wins and losses that would, over time, average out to their desired payout. The tapes were long enough that you would never likely be able to spot any kind of pattern, but they were deterministic in that the wins and losses were predetermined and happened in a particular sequence. And that sequence was only as truly random as whatever method they used to generate it and the casino's willingness to accept tapes with weird runs on them. Back then, the technology would allow you to decide precisely how often to pay out a jackpot, not just what the probability of doing so would be on any individual pull. We can use the knowledge that each pull is completely independent to dispel another common myth, or at least a frustrating scenario. Say you've been playing on a machine for an hour and losing hand over fist, so you finally take a break and step back. Up walks someone else who plays a few hands and then they hit the jackpot. There's a natural tendency to feel some ownership of that jackpot, since not only do you feel as though you helped fund the jackpot through all your losing, but you even would have won it if you'd only stuck around a few pulls more. But that's simply untrue because the win or loss is decided by random numbers being generated in the background. And these are being created by the million every pull, and there's no way that you were going to hit the button at the exact same millisecond as the person who ultimately did win it. And because their win could not have taken past events into consideration, their payout was not a function of you funding the jackpot any more than the general budget of the casino itself. The game decision logic has no idea how much or how little it is collected over time, and so it can't incorporate such information into the win-loss decisions. It also does nothing to reset or change the random number generation if you quick hit the stop button to stop the reels prematurely or poke the screen or do any of that stuff. That win-loss decision is made when you hit the spin button, and then you get to watch a little movie on the reels, more or less, that would serve to tell you what the outcome of your game is. In fact, in some tribal districts, they must base the game on bingo, which means the random number generator is used to create a bingo game, and then your slot winnings are actually determined from the bingo outcome. The slot reels are plainly disclosed right on the machines as entertainment value only. But if past events cannot change the odds, then what can? And the answer is pretty much limited to the casino itself. But it would be rather sinister if the casino staff could watch you winning and then crank down the payout percentage on your machine. 
I'm sure like a lot of folks have felt like the odds have changed dramatically out from underneath them once or twice, but the reality is that as far as I understand the law, and I'm not a lawyer and this is not legal advice, they cannot change the odds on a player in a single session. In fact, either as a courtesy or to cover their own butts, it appears that all the Vegas casinos I could check with appear to use a 15-minute grace period. Perhaps to allow for that bathroom break I was referring to earlier, if you leave a machine and return within 15 minutes, or if you leave your machine with a card in it, then the odds will be locked in still. Once the machine has been idle for about 15 minutes, they're free to change the odds at their leisure. Now, I'm just old enough to remember casinos when they still used actual coins and you carried around a little bucket with your wins and losses and there were wet naps available everywhere because coinage turns out to be pretty gross and dirty when you handle a lot of it. The machines back in those days were still electronic and run by a microprocessor, but they were old school and not networked. The hardware was on the level of, let's say, a Pac-Man arcade machine. Their code ran on a prompt chip, and if you wanted to adjust the odds on a machine, not only did it require a chip swap on the motherboard, but also, insofar as I can tell, they had to report it to the gaming commission on a paper form. In other words, it's safe to say they likely didn't change the odds on many machines very often. Today, however, everything is networked, and the machines can be monitored and adjusted and all done from a central server as long as it's in compliance with the rules. In terms of what they can set those odds to, we saw in the penny machine I went on that it had been set to 92%. The law in Nevada is that a slot machine must target a payback of at least 75%. And trust me, you would almost certainly not enjoy playing a machine at 75% for any length of time. It would eat you alive. So in reality, the odds are usually much better than that. We know that because casinos in Vegas are required to report what their payouts are. The stats from multiple casinos are then combined and made public for larger regions such as downtown Las Vegas or the Strip. It's also broken down by slot machine denomination, and that's an important clue that could and should impact the way you play. The differences in payouts between the Strip and other areas may also be a factor in your decision. Here in Washington State, as I understand it, Tribal casinos don't have to report anything like that, and they don't guarantee any target probability, but they have a general agreement amongst themselves that they won't go below 75%. There are no other apparent guarantees. When we look at the odds by slot machine denomination, we find a large variance. Within a single casino, the odds can range from 90% on penny slots all the way up to 98% on $25 slots. And that's a pretty big difference, and it means that all else equal, you're much better off playing the same amount of money as a smaller bet on a higher denomination machine than playing big hands on a penny machine. Now, that doesn't take into effect bonus games and other features that may require a particular bet level, but it's true of the odds in general. Now, I'm told by those who should know that they don't really place looser machines in high traffic areas, even if they ever did that. The theory used to be that this would allow people to see other folks winning, but the reality is that the payout ratios are reportedly pretty consistent within a denomination of a machine within a casino. Which is to say that the penny machines are all about the same as each other within a casino, and so on. I asked whether a casino might make a new game looser for the first few weeks in order to get customers hooked and then lower the odds once they like it, but I was told no comment with a wry smile. Now, the fact that I won on a penny machine proves, again, that we are talking about generalities and over the long term, but it can still make a very significant difference in your win-loss ratio, even over the course of a single weekend. Some people may find that unfair, but the way I look at it, the casino's cut goes to pay for the machine and the heat and the lights and staff and taxes and so on. If you're playing pennies at a time, they're going to have to take a slightly bigger cut of each play than if you're playing $25 at a time. Think of the higher denomination machines as receiving a bulk discount on the fixed cost of running a casino. And speaking of such things, a brief word on casino comps, which aren't a technical issue, but I feel like I should mention as they do figure into the math. You should take maximum advantage of comps and always use your player's card, but never ever play for comps. Remember, they constitute effectively about a 2% payback on your gambling play. You're playing for those perks, whether you track and redeem them or not, so you might as well reap their benefits, but only as long as you think you're psychologically able to avoid playing for the comps. Remember that 2% is still only 2%. It does matter over time, but spending $10 chasing after 20 cents would make no sense at all, pun intended. The big takeaway here, I guess, is to internalize the fact that each poll is independent, that the probabilities target a payout ratio, and that the reels are created after the fact from a random number generator, and that the machine never tries to psych you out with hot streaks or cold runs or jackpots that are due or any of that. And it's up to you to keep those things in mind as a player so that you don't chase ghosts in the casino. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please make sure that you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss follow-up episodes and other How Does It Work technical interest videos. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's basically everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then.
Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.